All right, good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on the Friday edition of the show. I'm here, me, Adebayo. Well, tonight on the show, we'll be looking at the aftermath of the Europa League. We now know the semi finalists. We'll continue uh, with what has become our countdown to the Olympics. Talking about Team Nigeria, all of the things uh, around Team Nigeria. We'll also uh, take a look at things happening on the domestic scene. It's not over in the English Premier League, even though it looks like uh, most of the fans have given it to one particular team. Six set of matches uh, still to go. And of course, this weekend, there's the FA Cup. There's also the English Premier League matches. That's the outlook for the show today. Is it too much show? My colleague Austin O'Connor Band is suited and ready. What a great thing to you, Ebony. And of course, everyone joining us on the show tonight. Still an action packed world of sports. In London, I'm Austin O'Connor. And yes, Yemi, I totally agree with you that in the English Premier League, it's not yet over. Yes, that's what fans in the United Kingdom are saying. Yes, you can say Manchester City, when they get to the top of the table, there's no looking back. They just cruise all the way. But football is 100% mental. Look at what happened to Liverpool right after they lost to Atalanta at Anfield. It was Crystal Palace that came over there again and stunned them. Now they're out of the Europa. Manchester City will play Chelsea in the English FA Cup. Manchester United will also be busy. There are games in the Premier League. Things will happen to that Premier League table. Brace up. All right, things will happen uh, on at that table. We'll see. We'll see whether or not it will, uh, the competition will be decided on the very last day. All right, let me introduce our partner, our guest in the Lagos studio, Damila Lonifade joins us now. Greetings, Damila. Thanks for finding out time to be with us on the show tonight. Yeah, I mean, it's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, I totally agree with uh, Austin that things will happen on that table. Um, even if all the teams are winning, points are going up. So things are happening. <laughs> it's a natural occurrence. I'll resist the temptation to talk, about, to talk about that so that we can talk about it when we should uh, be talking about it. Uh, but of course, let's talk about Nigeria. And of course, what's been happening, uh, the sports minister, uh, Mr. Sports Development, uh, John Enos, we've been talking about so many things. Uh, he was um, our guest on uh, the show uh, yesterday. And he's been in the news for the right reasons. Of course, there's been talk about the preparation of, of Team Nigeria. And of course, I'm very sure you also heard about what's been in the news. The partnership with the Younger Games uh, is what a lot of people have been talking about. And all geared towards redirecting Nigerian sports? Um, it, it's a lot of work to redirect Nigerian sports. I mean, just before we came on here, we were discussing it. And um, I, I hope that this time um, we, we're going to be bold enough to make the, the, the right call. Uh, because mm -hmm. the, the, the real problem has been the problem of structure. Yeah. You really can't build on nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes we are too much in a hurry for success that even when we seem to start well, we, because we just want the result now, Bongo we truncate result. it and just uh, veer off. I, I hope that, um, I've listened to the minister a lot of times, and I hope that he, he, he will have the, um, maybe the reward now is the political will, because, mm -hmm. I mean, he is the one to now give us the political will to ensure that uh, these things are done. Because I honestly believe that that's what we've been lacking for a long time. Uh, but it's good that you have a man that seems to be focused. Uh, I hope that at some point, the pressure of success, uh, for example, um, even if I'm in his shoes, I probably will have the same pressure. There was, an, uh, the last Olympics was probably our best in years. Uh, the Harvard Nigerian would not listen to any excuse if we, if we don't do as well as the last one. But we know that if you don't do as well as the last one, it might not matter. What matters is what is the future looking like. And that's the most important thing. There was a time the Jamaicans were sweeping everywhere mm -hmm. in athletics. They are not there now, but guess what? They are building. In another three, four Olympics from now, you see them bounce back and it's like, where, have, where are they coming from? When are we going to get to that point where we can also have sustained success uh, for a period? And I think that's the, that's the burden on the ministry. All right, that's the burden on the ministry. And of course, he's been doing his best. Yeah. Uh, of course, games, uh, technologies, uh, of course, signing that partnership. Let's quickly listen to uh, the Minister of Sports Development, um, of course, his take on uh, the partnership and, and of course, uh, the benefits that will accrue. Today, if not only historic, 
but also symbolic. As the Honorable Minister unveils a new initiative that will change the landscape of Nigeria, Nigerian sports for good. Over the years, there were lots of initiatives that should have had a solid foundation for our sports, but they were truncated by systematic failure, lack of political willpower, and policy somersaults. We intend to turn past errors into experience that will shape the future. Like the Honorable Minister, my team and I believe that this project will stand the test of time. And it has gone through many stages of scrutiny by experts and critical stakeholders who would help midwife this initiative. More than any other human endeavor, sports has earned Nigeria global attention in football, basketball, track and field, boxing, wrestling, weightlifting, and other events where we have produced world champions. The Honorable Minister of Sports Development and Yanga Games have signed a landmark agreement that will enhance sports development and give benefits to the athletes, the fans, and all stakeholders. I wish to commend the Honorable Minister's commitment, concern, and passion for the welfare of athletes and the subsistent policy of providing infrastructure which resonates with the federal government agenda of creating an, an enabling environment for sports to thrive through private sector investments. The expectation and the determination of younger games in this collaboration. If, for example, the Minister of Sports Development, like I am, and then you have an initiative and an idea coming from someone who is concerned and who says, for example, that the partnership and the support as part of his company's corporate social responsibility is to help the ministry in the next couple of years, four or five years, generate upwards of 35 billion. You will jump at it, won't you? And that's why I jumped at it, and that's why we are here. Like I said, every of the points in our strategic roadmap is important, but particularly is the situation with our outlets. On a constant basis, those are my WhatsApp numbers. They keep sending to me photographs and different situations of our athletes that have done us proud in the past, but who now are abandoned because they can't even fend for themselves. Now, that is not a good testimony for upcoming athletes, is it? It's a discouragement. And the only way they cannot get discouraged is what? Is if they find out that there is what? There is a system that will take care of them while they are active and will take care of them when they are retired. As for those who work in government, isn't that system in place? It's in place. So there's no reason why that system cannot be in place for sports and for different athletes. All right, a landmark agreement, a partnership geared towards uh, revenue generation. You listen to Derek Kentebe, the executive chairman of uh, the Younger uh, Games Technologies. You also listen to uh, the Minister of Sports Development, John Enno. Uh, also, you listen to them, so, so many takeaways uh, from all of this. Uh, this minister said, look, there's nobody that would, you know, get this kind of offer and not jump at it because it will definitely help. It will, I mean, I remember during my master's degree program, uh, my dissertation was focused on sports for development in Nigeria, the impact of sports, and I narrowed it down to football. One of the recommendations that I found out of that research study is collaboration with the private sector to come up with programs, viable programs, backed up with effective policies that should be implemented to ensure that we achieve development at the level where it is profitable. And I like what the minister just said about, you know, getting into these sort of programs and then it's generating profit, generating monies, and we're treating it as business. And that's just the way to go. Look at South Africa. When they pushed into the private sector, 
All government was just concerned was the structure and some sort of ownership, but private sector was in charge of branding, marketing, getting revenues, and look at South Africa and their sports today. Look at the PSL. Morocco, the government has started putting a lot of money, but now they're beginning to bring in the private sector into it to maintain it. That's the way to go. Look at sports in the United States of America. So this younger sports, I just hope that it's not just going to be signatures on paper, and then John or one Eno is out of office tomorrow, and we start asking questions. Let's put words to action, because truly, it's time to get the private sector involved. The other day, I was talking to the NOC, and because they don't understand the language, they didn't even get the message I was trying to get. The NOC answers truth and nail everything to the ministry, because as an organization, they don't even have money. They're not even going out there to seek funding. They can't fend for themselves. They can't stand on their own. So when you go to the ministry all the time, it's whatever the ministry tells you that you're going to do. So by the time we make this proper, back it up with effective policies, make the business environment thrive, let people understand that, look, when you go out there to play football or watch football or in whatever way you're contributing to the ecosystem, you should do it for your profit. And I think that's when we will take this football business to the next level. Otherwise, we'll just keep dreaming and dreaming and waiting for God to hear me. Yeah, uh, we, ha we had the pleasure of, uh, you know, listening to the sports minister. And one of the things that I also take away is that we, we, we need laws that shape our sports. We need laws. So it will get to a point where we will have institutions and it wouldn't matter who is there. I mean, in, in what Austin said now, there, there's always the fear that if, there, if, if a person is the initiator of an idea, once a person leaves, then, then what happens? But if you have laws that shape things and it becomes like an institution, all you need to do is just get the right people there and things will flow seamless. It doesn't matter who the individual is. That's always the fear when you begin to have good ideas like this, will it uplift the initiator? I think one of the, um, if, if there is any trick in our laws at all, I, I, I would always believe that in every sphere of, uh, uh, of our country, I don't think the laws are the problem. The problem is implementing a situation where people are Whatever accountable. Whatever you have. Where people are accountable. Um, if I know I'm going to come into an office and questions will be asked and I have, I have a responsibility that I'm, I must answer for it. Then I'm, I mean, you can't come into an office and there is a good project and you abandon it. When you know they will ask you, what did you make of it? it it's that simple. But if nobody is going to ask myself, or they can ask me and I will not answer, I mean, it's just, it's a free for all so situation. So you, you feel there is really not the need to have specific laws law made for sports? I'm not saying we should not have laws, but I think the ones we have now, what are we doing with them? To start with. To start with. Okay. <laughs> because I did, making new laws that you, you don't have the will uh, to enforce will still not make any difference. It's not as if we don't have any law now. I mean, it's not as if we don't. So yeah. the ones we, they, the former minister also have a few programs, like the Adopt the Athlete program. So he's out of office. What are we doing with that program? Um, what I expect is that even if it's not perfect, the part of it that we need to tweak is yeah. what we should tweak, not All abandon right. it. All right. Uh, the, the part of the law that I said is that things should have something it stands on, because if it doesn't, then... But, but let's see how it goes. Uh, interesting times ahead. Austin has laid it, and, and I hope that all our institutions will start functioning uh, the way they should and run effectively. All right, let's quickly uh, move on. Antigua, Nigeria, uh, Premier Football League. I'm going to go across now. It's hotting up. Match day 31 is what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at the fixtures. And we're going to talk about what will likely happen this weekend in the matches. So I'll just quickly go across now and uh, talk about these matches. Um, all right. So, um, of course, today, Heartland and 3SC. Uh, a lot of fans of 3SC are beginning to believe. Um, so, but there you have it. They lost, uh, went to the Nazi Millionaires. Will that be enough for, the, for Heartland to, you know, escape <laughs> relegation? We'll see. Uh, they're not in a good position right about now. All right. So, this is what happened today, March day 31. But let's look at other matches 
and um, matches will be played uh, on Saturday and on Sunday. For tomorrow, Abia Warriors will take on by Elsa United. That's for tomorrow. Then let's flip quickly and take a look at Sunday. On Sunday, Cora United will take on Aqua United. Rivers United will take on Rangers International. This is my pick uh, of um, the bunch. Sunshine Stars will take on uh, the Abaya Elephants uh, Imba. Lobby Stars will take on Bedell Assurance. Uh, an opportunity for Lobby Stars to climb up and show their title credentials. Cano Pillars will be up against Gobe United. Niger Tornadoes up against Doma United. Plenty United up against Remo Stars. Austin, a lot of interesting matches to uh, take from. Uh, but then again, I don't know which one uh, is your pick, uh, but it will be interesting to, to see uh, Rivers United and Rangers. You got that right out, of, right, out of, right out of my mouth here. I mean, Rivers United needs to, you know, pick all the points that they can get to, you know, get relevant on that league table. The season is fast coming to, to an end, and if they drop points now, then they might just as well be asking questions as regards qualifying for the continent. They've had a good taste of it. They like the attention. They see that they can make money from it. So the least they want to do now is try to finish in the top three. But it's going to be very difficult with Rangers, Aimba, Lobby, and even shooting stars trying to have a peep into what they can do as regards winning the league title. So Rivers United Rangers will really def will definitely get us talking. Rivers United did just enough to win their last game. Rangers had to dig deep in that Oriental derby against Abia Warriors. They won that one 3-2. The thing about Rangers these days, when you score them, they also score you. They are conceding. Coach Fidelis in the Chuku doesn't like it, but a win is a win particularly if it keeps you in a position where you can actually believe to win the league title. I'd like to see what Quara United can do against Aqua United. They were the only team on March the 30th that went away to pick a point. They defeated um, Gumbi United by two goals to one. Aqua United crushed Niger Tornadoes 4-1. But they've been bad travelers. Some will say, calm down, they beat Canopillars. Pillars. Look, in the MPFL, for you to actually have some say, you need to win about five matches away and draw some also on the road to get, you know, talking. But Aqua United, they've been poor on the road. They've been poor in New York. Now they need to show that they can do something against the, the Harmony Boys. I like Quara United because when they want to play football, they really come out to play football. So if you take a look at it, I was, I was thinking 3SC could do something today against Heartland. That tells you the story about the English Premier, about the, the Nigeria Premier Football League. You might think a team that is doing so well now uh, can just run over a small team and then you hear a shocking result. Lobby Stars, a team that is, that's that been decent all season, they fell to shooting stars in a bad one. So with that 2-0 win by the Olu Yole Warriors, I was expecting that, hmm, against Heartland that has been struggling all season, they can just do something, maybe kick a point on the, on, on the road or even beat them the same way that we've seen them do this season, going to Kano Pillars to also, you know, pick a win. But but it didn't happen. Heartland went on to win that one. So it's 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 the league for you. Can Sunshine Stars bounce back after that struggling defeat to Sporting Lagos? They lost by a single goal and now they're going to host Aimba. And we know Aimba, they're like the Man City of Nigeria. When they are on that top three, all they start hearing is Unzobu Zobu bring back the title. So what can Aimba do? at Sunshine Stars, we'll wait. All right, we'll wait. Um, Dan Lola, quickly, if, if you can, probably we'll go on a break later and talk about it, but I'm very sure Rangers, Rivers United will be on your mind as well. Definitely. I mean, that's, that's, for me, that's the big game of the weekend. Um, Rangers at the top of the table. Um, Rivers, yeah, in the bottom four, but then with six games at, at hand, so they have a lot of things to play for. But that of shooting start is also of concern. Disappointing result. All right, it's a morning result. Uh, let's go on a break. I'm very sure Daniel Lassie has a lot to say about uh, the Nigeria Premier Football League. We'll go on a break. We'll return. We'll still be on the matter talking about uh, the Nigeria Premier Football League. All right, welcome back. Before we went on that break, Daniel Olifadi was breaking things down with regards to the Nigeria Premier Football League. He says the results. Um, Fortunately, that was disappointing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you consider that Heartland have been struggling, but 
what other games do you think we should look out for? Um, also talk about Quara United. Uh, you know, there's also Sunshine, Aimba. I, mean, I think I think Plateau Red Monsters is also a game that should be interesting um, because Red Monsters have a lot to play for. Plateau also, uh, it's, Plateau United is a big side, uh, maybe not as um, doing as well as one would expect mm -hmm. this season. But then that does not take away the fact that they they, they are usually there and about uh, at the top of the table. Um, and Red Monsters have a lot to play for this. They started so well at some point. Um, I think uh, the form dipped a little, but they also are propping up the table. And Remo, once Remo is in the league, they, they are always looking at that continental place. And I think that's a, a prospect for them and a possibility this season. Even though it's looking tighter mm -hmm. by the day. I mean, with Rangers, Aimba, shooting stars came from nowhere. And that's why I said the, today's result is a but bit But with eight matches to play, can, can it still be done? It can still be done. It can still be done. It's, it's, it's the Nigerian Maybe Premier not League. Maybe um, For Remo. Uh, I don't think it's the title. But at least on the title. continent. But on the continent, I think that's a very, very good possibility. And I think they will do it. All right, all right. So uh, let's move on now. And, of course, we're going to Austin's end. But before we do, let's talk about uh, the FA Cup. Semi-final fixtures. I'll go across in a bit uh, to take a look at it. And Austin will uh, be telling us some of the things we probably have not heard uh, in the build-up to those matches. Uh, of course... You know, here it is. Uh, Manchester City are uh, smarting from that loss in the UEFA Champions League. We'll be up against Chelsea on Saturday. That's tomorrow. And on Sunday, well, a lot of people feel Manchester United has an easy pass against Coventry. But, but, but it must be said, for Coventry to get to this point, they should be taken seriously. So those two uh, matches. So, Daniel, a quick one for you to Austin. Manchester City... Chelsea. Chelsea, this is the only opportunity to win anything. A lot of people are even saying, put your energy into this one because you're definitely not going to win the league and you're not going to be getting relegated. So why not just put your energy? But then they are up against Manchester City. Uh, uh, well, for me, you, you, you might find it a bit surprising that we're going this direction, that both teams have not won anything yet. So even for Man City, uh, they've not won the league. Yet they are two points at top of the league. But they, <laughs> they've not won anything. They've not won anything. Why is everybody giving it to them? I tell it. That's the point. They've not won anything. So they even can't let go of this because they're out of the Champions League. The Carabao Cup is You never can know what's going to happen with the league. You never can know what will happen in the league. That's nice that the Liverpool is still there. And so... Um, what makes this game more difficult is that as well as Man City seems to have played this season, they've struggled against Chelsea. Mm -hmm. They've really struggled against Chelsea. In fact, in the 3-3 the draw they played, Chelsea was ahead. They had to come from behind. So uh, I don't think they will take it for granted that um, you can't look at Chelsea's position to predict this game. You have to look at the head-to-head -head against Man City, particularly this season, mm -hmm. uh, to have a sneak peek into what will probably what will happen. happen. I, I think there is a slight edge for City. Uh, because they've been here all the time and they know how to manage this to latter part of the season. Yeah. Uh, but then I would not take it for granted. I would not be shocked if Chelsea wins. All right. Coventry, United? I would also not be shocked if Coventry wins. Wow. Honestly. That, that, that's a bold call. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be um, that bold uh, asked to make uh, such a call. Uh, but, well, the, uh, our man is at the center of everything. Uh, Austin, what are you hearing? There's this talk Pep Guardiola saying today that, look, Cole Palmer had wanted to leave even two seasons before uh, because a lot of people are giving him a lot of flack for letting a young man go and he seems to be doing well and said, look, stop blaming me for this young man. He has always wanted to leave. And another thing Pep Guardiola didn't say uh, at that press is where would Cole Palmer have played in that city team? It was tight. It was choked. It was big competition. And the youngster just wanted to play football. He wanted to prove a point. You're not going to have two field foldings on your team. It's like what happened to Kelechi and Nacho when Pep came in. He had to ask the Nacho, look at the team. Where are you going to fit in? Where are you going to play, you know? So it's, it's rather unfortunate. But Cole Palmer, I took his destiny into his own hands. He just wanted to play football. And he left to Chelsea. And now he's, he's, he's lighting up um, the Premier League. He's such a fantastic player. But yeah, you can look at it now as and Manchester City will regret, but this is City with with the Saudi money, you know. You never know. Next season you might just be seeing Cole Palmer back to the ETR. But let's go into latest updates as regards that FA Cup game between Chelsea and Manchester City. We're hearing updates that 
Erling Haaland might just miss out of that game. His availability is not yet certain because Pep Guardiola is keeping it close to his chest. Uh, he only told the media that Haaland requested to be substituted in that semi-final Champions League game against Real Madrid. So we don't really know what's wrong, but he's not been confirmed. And so he might just be missing that um, semi-final action against Chelsea. And if you take a look at Chelsea and Manchester City this season, you can't just come out and say it's going to be an easy run for Manchester City because Chelsea has shown that they know how to play City. They're beginning to understand the man to man marking and closing up spaces and waiting for City to make that mistake and then they jump on the counter. And with the form we're seeing now from Cole Palmer, Madweke is willing to play now. Modric just needs to step it up a bit further and you know you never know what the Chelsea might just be giving it a grand, you know, finish to the season. But Chetino is banking on psychological play. He says he's hoping that the Champions League exit will work against Manchester City and work to his favor. But Pep Guardiola has been reacting. Let's listen to the City boss on the show tonight. <laughs> We don't have another option. I don't want to feel sorry for ourselves. In football, you lose games. So we perform at our best. We could are not able to win. So what next? So we, we don't have time to reflect. We reflect in summertime, what happened during all the season. So in football, it's you win, you compete to win. That is what you have done. But sometimes you win, sometimes, most of the times, well, lately in this club didn't happen in years, but sometimes you lose games, so, and is it what happened? I am not a person that have bad feelings, you know, when things happen, happen because it's a, it's a special circumstance. Uh, now I am not thinking on that, you know, hope that we can win and go through, you know, to the final, that is our objective, but we are not... I am not going there thinking in, in that. I think I have too many good uh, memories uh, from from Wembley. We play too many too many games. Hope that one day can leave a trophy there. That is my my dream. That is what uh, we want, uh, like a coaching and staff. And and of course for the club should be it could be amazing. But of course I I don't have uh, bad feelings and I am we are thinking and focusing try to to try to, to win the game and go through to the final. Chelsea manager Mauricio Pochettino, uh, he said it is going to be a very tough game for Chelsea and Manchester City. Uh, but Damilala Onifadi, he told the BBC that he knows that City has got an unbelievable squad that might just change it for them. Um, definitely, that we all know what City can do. Um, if there is one team that can easily bounce back from defeat, it's, it's Manchester City. And one advantage City has is if one player is not playing, whoever is on the bench is as good as the, the guy that is playing. Uh, I, I probably will not lose sleep if I'm a City fan if um, Alan is not playing. Because when Alan wasn't playing, City didn't stop scoring anyway. I think it makes it even, it makes them less predictable if, if Alan is not playing. Um, so, uh, City has the squad, no doubt about it. But I'm still banking on the fact that Chelsea definitely has a chance in this game because of what they've done against City this season. Chelsea has a chance, and I know Pep will also not take it for granted that this game is won or lost uh, as far as this FA Cup is concerned. Because I insist, City has not won anything yet as well this season. <laughs> Daniela wants to underline that fact again and again uh, that City has not won uh, anything. All right, let's move. Uh, we're still in England, but uh, quickly, let's uh, go on to talk about the English Premier League. Uh, it's going to come across your screen right now. I'm going to go across and take a look at those matches. We'll run, we'll run through those matches. All right, starting from tomorrow, Luton Town will be up against Brentford, Sheffield United up against Burnley. Wolverhampton Wanderers will take on Arsenal. Uh, so, uh, interesting matches we played on Saturday. Let's take a look at, uh, let's flip it and look at the other matches on Sunday. Everton will take on Nottingham Forest. Aston Villa will take on Bournemouth. Crystal Palace will take on West Ham United. Fulham will take on Liverpool. These are matches uh, to look forward to in the English Premier League. All right. Uh, the Arsenal manager has been speaking. It's hard to 
answer a lot of questions. Um, seems a bit deflated after the loss to Bayern Munich. Let's listen to Mikel Arteta on the show. Well, obviously, it's been um, a very intense journey. Um, and when you're to be at the top and you are fighting with such a level, um, you know that you're going to have to go through that. Uh, this job, um, this industry is constantly testing your resilience. It's constantly testing your ego. When things go well, when things don't go well, and you all the time have to be recycling that, and you have to be able to navigate and go through those moments in, in a natural way, understanding the context and looking at the positives. That's the best thing you can do because that's the ones that really help learn and look forward. Try to find ways and prepare the games to try to help them. Um, if they do try to do certain things to stop us to find other ways, um, other spaces, other players, other combinations. And this is a journey that we want to stop because there's always something else that they try. You have to adapt it and, and uh, make it work. Uh, all right. Uh, interesting conversation going on here. I'm very sure by the time we get to Austin, we'll probably say the same. Everybody seems to agree that the problem with Arsenal is not, is, is very easy. It's not complicated. They lack depth. Simple. They do. It, it's, it's obvious. Um, I mean, look at the teams around them, the teams they want to compete against. Yeah. Um, whatever you think of Chelsea, you can make the excuse for Chelsea that it's taking time for the team to come together. But they have depth. But they have depth. I mean, you take out one player, the player coming in can almost deliver mm -hmm. at that level. At the same level. At that same level. You take out a, um, a De Bruyne and then there is a Foden. Mm -hmm. You take out a Grealish, there is a Doku. Um, you take out a stone, there is a Diaz, there is um, a Natanaki, there is I mean, Mafia Konji. And the but, standards but come do not now. drop. Come to us now. Um, and then you take out, they don't even have a proper number nine. Let's start from there. Mm -hmm. And so whether you play <laughs> Azuz or Kai Havertz in the number nine position or Trossard, they don't give you the same threats that you see in a Darwin Nunes, in an Haaland, mm -hmm. or even Giorgi Capo. And so the depth is not there. Um, you take out Odegaard. Who do you have on the bench to play in that number 10 position? You'll probably be thinking of Fabio Vieira. And he would not give you up to 30% of Odegaard. Emil Smith-Rowe is the closest that comes. He's the but closest, not, but he's he not seems not to even have the same confidence in him anymore. So the depth is lacking. And uh, so it's obvious to see. And if Arsenal will go another summer without start signing a top nine, then I will actually know that they are not interested in winning titles. They just want to play beautiful football, and their fans can make do with that. Well, I, I don't know uh, if I should be saying this or not, but, but I also think if, if you're going to play in just one way, no matter what is happening, then you have a problem. Carlo Ancelotti showed us recently that, look, there, there are many ways to skin a cat, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's a problem. Maybe you learned it from Pep Guardiola. Think about Mikel Arteta. I do not know, but there should always... You should always be able to try something else and not stick to one thing, even when it's not working. Uh, that's what a lot of fans think. All right, let me yield to Austin. We're going to talk about El Clasico in a bit, but I'm very sure Austin also has a thing or two to say about the Gunners, but everybody seems to be in agreement that squad lacks depth. I understand the frustrations of Arsenal fans all over the world. I was listening to talk sports today and Arsenal fans have been leaving. They don't like this almost nearly. We were close to it story that they are getting, you know, in the last two, three seasons. Uh, Mikel Ateta does a good job in identifying the problems with this Arsenal team, but he never, never, ever finds any way to solve it. He just mentioned it again that this is a league that keeps testing your resilience. What's the level of resilience in that team, particularly when you've not got depth? Look at Saliba and Gabriel playing almost all the games all season. Look at Saka. Sometimes I just feel for him. I think in the last four years, that guy's been playing almost every competitive game you can think about for the Arsenal. For a club with Arsenal stature, with a financial uh, figures, budget that they control now, for a club that could bring over a million pounds to sign Declan Rice, then you should be thinking about options, options, you know? Yeah, you brought in Kai Havertz, but he's not that kind of player that will give you, you know, consistent performances all season. Yeah, but find some way to have a replacement for him. Uh, if you tweak the team in any way, it should be a team that will continue from where the last one stopped. 
You cannot be chasing the league title with Liverpool and Man City and you are hosting Aston Villa and you're losing by two goals to nothing. The Emirates. It's too difficult to understand, you know. And and I was hearing fans saying, look, if you they don't beat Wolverhampton Wanderers, that they should just withdraw from the league. It's funny, but that's the level of frustration that these fans have. And I don't blame them because time and time again, the Gunners have lost games that they shouldn't be losing that should keep them going and give them prominence. It tells you that is mental strength that is missing some way, somehow. Because when you punch the relevance of such game, Two players that are particularly just coming up, then it's going to be very difficult and difficult for them to process it mentally. They will lack that resilience that is needed to go for that. Look at Real Madrid. They know that they were going to suffer at the Etihad against Man City, but they did what they just had to do. We need to score, and even if they score, we know it shouldn't be more than one. And if they score a second one, we have to score. It shows you that they understand the Champions League. They love it. They build their mindset on how to approach it. When you want to win the league title that you've not won in so many years, and you came so close last season, there must be lessons learned that you should have carried into this season to make sure that you don't repeat the same mistake. But as it is, it's still same old, same as now. All right, the same old as now. All right, let's uh, move on. And, I mean, we could go on and on uh, talking about uh, the problems, but uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's talk about the El Clasico. Um, uh, a lot of people say, is me watered down? But, but let me even start with Damilola. Uh, do you feel? Back in the days, the hype was so much. It didn't matter who the coach was. Um, as long as you had Messi on one side and Ronaldo on the other side, you don't have boats. You don't have Pep Guardiola and Mourinho in the dugout anymore. So... It's a bit, but, but what's your make? Is, is this still the greatest, the biggest club football game on the planet as it used to be? Um, I, I, it's difficult to answer that question with a yes or no. Um, because their classical have always been big without Messi and Ronaldo. But what Messi and Ronaldo brought into it was it really to a proportion that, that is difficult to, to explain. And I don't think we'll ever get back to that height until probably uh, you have a peak, Ronaldo, a peak Mbappe and a peak Alan now join the two clubs. Maybe that, that's what will take it close to that again. But the classical is still what it is. The other side of it is these two uh, fantastic players left. And... Um, the El Clasico seems not to be competitive. I mean, if you're going into the El Clasico and you have a point difference of two between the two sides, and the El Clasico will have made a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. The hype will stop at that. But you're going into this one, and Wait. the point difference is eight points. Even if Barcelona wins this, it there is no guarantee that Madrid will lose. Yeah. And, and those are the factors that are playing around. And you also look at this, um, the, 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 the personnel as well. There is a, um, a big difference in terms of talent. I mean... Barcelona fans will not like this. Whether you like it or not, put those two teams side by side. In terms uh, of say, quality. In terms of quality, you say Madrid is still far better ahead. And I think that's also a factor. That gap wasn't that wide before now, but it's getting wider. And with the absence of Ronaldo and Messi, it just makes it look as if... Uh, and I also think the popularity of the EPL has also affected uh, the prominence of the El Clasico. The EPL wasn't this... Um, in those years. In those years, that the El Clasico was big without Messi and Ronaldo. I think that has also played a factor. All right, let me go to also another angle to, to, to look at this from. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if, if you're a neutral, you would want to sympathize with Barcelona with all the financial issues that they're dealing with. And it doesn't appear that they are out of the woods yet. So in the next few seasons, they're still going to have to find maybe players at the tail end of their careers, get players who are good but probably wouldn't have played for Barcelona on in normal, in, in normal circumstances, would probably would have... So you, you, could, you could see that it's tilted towards Real Madrid and it's likely going to be like that for the next two, three seasons unless they get money from somewhere magically. But it takes just one phenomenal display and then everything will change. Like if you take a look at the La Liga table now, it's Real Madrid on top, then Barcelona, then on, in third place is not Atletico, it's not Valencia, it's Girona. That's football for you. But Barcelona will remain that team with character, that team with prestige, that team with a rich tradition. And that alone can lure big players to go to the club. They just need to find their way to get out of 
this financial mess that they've put themselves into because they put themselves into it. But for them to, you know, still come out big names like Lewandowski, and they've got good young players also that can come up the rank, you know, and the academy is, is also working so well. So, I mean, it takes just one good season. One good season. Look at what is happening in Germany. Just one good season. I won't be saying this again, but I totally agree with you. It's advantage Real Madrid. I also belong to that class. I believe Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi not being in La Liga. The La Liga has still got a rich tradition and it commands respect all over the world. Go look at the numbers, the viewership. This is a rivalry that has been running since 1929. And every time it is coming up, even if you like, carry names that are not known. As long as it is the La Liga, the media will make those names known. And if you take a look at the league table now, 31 matches played. Real Madrid are on top with 78 points. Barcelona follows closely with 70 points. They win tomorrow. They cut that to five points. And then we're going to have a proper race to the end of the season. So it makes that game on Sunday a really competitive one. And if you take a look at Barcelona at this year's UEFA Champions League, they, they proved the point when they went to PSG. There's another school of thought, oh, it's PSG. But this season, PSG is also showing us that they want to compete uh, and, you know, maybe give a, a, a farewell gift to Kylian Mbappe before he leaves. So there were no pushover in that first leg in France. But Barcelona won. And it's not for the red card to Araujo. Barcelona did just enough. Even with the numerical advantage, they still took the play to PSG. And I think they will just, you know, take that into stride and say, look, we can still be that big team that we are. We are Barcelona. They've got top players across the park. And with, with derbies, you never say never. It, it could just, you know, turn around when you least expect it. So I'm very open for that one too, on Sunday. I think that Barcelona can actually push Real Madrid. And Real Madrid have got the Champions League right in their face now. They don't want anything to go wrong as regards the Champions League. So that might just also, you know, blow their vision and attention at BTME. All right. Um, uh, all right. Our pass is short, but... I know you would have liked to elaborate, you know, you, you don't want me to put you in yes, yes, no <laughs> situations, uh, but just, just see what you can do. Is, is this a title decider or, or is decided already? Because Austin seems to believe that, look, Austin doesn't agree with you because he feels if Barcelona wins, it's still wide open. It but, makes, for, for neutrals, it makes the league more interesting, um, but I don't think they will catch up. That's even my if position, they win. even if they win. I don't think they will I think, I think this season is done. Real Madrid will win it. Um, they will win this title. That's my opinion. It makes it more interesting for neutrals to watch. Not less boring. But in your mind, it's still... Less boring by itself. Even if they have to maintain the five points at the end, they will. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's a good place uh, to leave it. We'll see what happens. I don't know if Austin agrees, but... Uh, we got to go. I know you're going to say something, but we got to go. Yeah, but that, that's the point. I like how damn, that damn letter on the Friday landed with it. You know, these things, you have this confidence, you me until something just goes wrong and you start asking what happened. That letter, it takes just three draws. Three draws. And we'll start asking questions. But yeah, we are neutral, so we'll just leave it the way it is. That's the show. In London, I'm Austin O'Connor. And in everything you do, remember, keep talking sports. Bye for now. All right, we've crossed the finish line. We're about to go, but first, I want to thank Damla Lonifadi for his time on the show. Always a pleasure. Right, hopefully, we'll do this again some other time. God willing. All right. <laughs> That's the show. Today is the last one for the week. Thanks for allowing us into your homes without knocking. It's a privilege we will never take for granted. you see us again next week. I'm Yemi Adebayo. Bye-bye now.